Okay, so again, my name is Kristen Lillyman and I'm an engagement specialist with Dillon Consulting. We have been working with the city to coordinate and facilitate the engagement for the Municipal Comprehensive Review, or as you may know it, our Plan Toronto. Many of you may have attended um, or participated in meetings with the city in the past on the official plan in the fall or in recent meetings uh, in April on the environment and climate change policies. So this is the second meeting in a series of meetings to present draft policies uh, and the draft vision and directions, some of which will go to the Planning and Housing Committee on July 5th. Next slide. So I'm going to begin tonight uh, with a land acknowledgement. The City of Toronto acknowledges that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. The City also acknowledges that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaties, signed with multiple Mississaugas and the Chippewa Bands. Acknowledging the land is only a small piece of recognizing the contributions and history of Indigenous peoples and the connection to the land that we now call Toronto, as well as Lake Ontario, dates back at least 10,000 years. A key part of our plan Toronto is and has been the integration of Indigenous perspectives, history and understandings as part of this process. The team has also integrated the great work on the Reconciliation Action Plan into this renewed official plan, uh, which will be presented on later tonight. So I'm just gonna get into the agenda. So if you can go to the next slide. So first, uh, we're going to provide a refresher on the background of the official plan. Then there'll be an overview of the major transit station areas an update on employment policies and employment area conversions, an overview of the Indigenous planning perspectives, and also the draft official plan vision statement and directions. And as you'll see from the agenda, there is time for questions and discussion between each section. We'll then share uh, a few next steps with you and wrap up the meeting hopefully by 8 p.m. tonight. Next slide. So just a few introductions. We are joined today by those at the city who are leading the official plan, including Jeff Cantos, and I will now ask him to introduce the city team. Sure. Thanks, Kristen. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jeff Cantos. I'm the uh, manager of the, the, city, the city's official plan team, and I'm joined by uh, a number of staff here to uh, help in this uh, in this engagement evening. So if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. There's a number of uh, subject matter experts on the call, um, including members of my team in the official plan, uh, Pauline Beaupre, uh, Amy Chung, and Ali Darwish. And from the folks working on major transit station areas, uh, Josh Wise, Malcolm Duncan's here, and um, we have our colleagues from Economic Development and Culture, uh, Candice Valenti, and working uh, st staff are working, a senior plan working on expanding housing options uh, in neighborhoods at uh, Philip Parker. Uh, back over to you, uh, Kristen. Hey, thanks, Jeff. And I did also want to uh, introduce two of my colleagues I have here with me tonight, uh, Nicole Bugley and Ish Chowdhury. We'll both be helping manage the, the meeting from behind the scenes, including taking meeting minutes of tonight. We'd also love to welcome participants to introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, we'd love to know who is with us tonight and also you can get to know each other. Next slide. Just a bit of uh, housekeeping before we begin. Uh, please remain muted when you are not talking so we can reduce background noise. If you do have a question or comment, um, again, we are encouraging that and we want to hear from you. So please use the raise hand function or type your question into the, into the chat box. And if you are calling in, which I don't see anybody doing so, but if you are dialing in on the phone, you can press three to raise your hand. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, we are encouraging use of the chat, so please use it. It is being monitored by staff and questions may be responded to live there. There will be a dedicated discussion points throughout the presentation to address questions. And I will ask that you please introduce yourself uh, before asking your question so we know who we're hearing from. 
As I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, we are recording it today. Uh, and we will only post the presentation component online on the city website. The comments and discussion that occur tonight uh, with participants will only be used for note-taking purposes only. Now, I just wanted to mention a little bit about my role as meeting facilitator for tonight. So my job is to manage the discussion and make sure everyone gets a chance to be heard. And, and to ensure everyone is able to participate, we do ask that you think about and raise the question that you most want to be answered. We will strongly encourage uh, one question per person. If you don't get your question answered to live, there is always the chat uh, function as well, and uh, we will have a Q&A as well in our engagement records. Next slide, please. So again, we do welcome your questions and we'll have those periods for discussion. Uh, there are no bad questions and chances are if you're thinking about asking it, there's people on the call who are also thinking the same question. So please don't be shy. Um, we do want to hear from everyone. Uh, we do believe that everyone has wisdom and experience to share. On that note, please be respectful and listen. We do recognize that uh, when we ex share our experiences, they may, may have differences of opinion and perspectives, but again, everyone deserves to be heard. The city is here today and tonight to listen to your feedback and thoughts and perspectives. So again, please don't be shy with the raise hand and, and using the chat function. So next slide, I'll just go a little bit deeper into the chat function. So the chat box, um, as we've mentioned, will be available throughout the meeting tonight. And we do encourage the use of the chat to get to know each other, share ideas, ask your questions. The city project team will be monitoring the chat and we'll try to respond to questions there. But just a quick reminder to be respectful. We do wanna keep the chat active and if there are any disrespectful or abusive comments, we will have to close the chat. So next slide. So why are we all here tonight? Uh, city staff are going to provide an overview of the employment policies, the major transit station area delineations, and the draft vision and directions. We also, again, wanna hear your feedback. So we'll open up to discussion and dialogue. We'll then share next steps with you and how you can continue to be engaged in the project. Next slide. So this slide uh, provides just a, a quick snapshot of the project process to date. Um, the project initially launched in May of last year, and we've gone through parts one, the vision and priorities, and then part two, asking some big questions and setting policy directions. And during that time, uh, the city and our Dillon engagement team were doing a lot of listening through public meetings, youth engagement, online engagement and surveys, meetings with Indigenous rights holders and organizations, and through a community leader circle. So now we're at the point uh, here in part three, where we are continuing to meet with people and organizations to discuss our plan Toronto, but the city has created draft policies. So, so, so far in part three, we have held some meetings on uh, the environment and climate change policies, and they went to Planning and Housing Committee on May 31st and then City Council on June 15th. Some of you may have uh, joined us for those calls as well. And so we're, we are now hosting, including this meeting, a series of public meetings on the other draft official plan policies, which are leading to a report to Planning and Housing Committee on July 5th. So we're going to share some other uh, key next steps as well as some upcoming meeting dates with you at the end of this presentation as well. Next, next slide. Okay, great. So in part one and two, and so far in part three, we have held over 60 meetings and met with over 2000 people, including various uh, external and internal stakeholders, organizations, companies, residents. And this work really included a focus on reaching underrepresented uh, equity deserving populations and groups that work with them. So that included Indigenous rights holders and organizations, youth through schools and school boards, seniors through the Seniors Roundtable, and, and we had some focused conversations as well. So around things like accessibility and in specific geographies like Scarborough. So we also had an online component, uh, the R Plan website and our story maps, which is an online resource to explore information and maps related to this project. 
they have received over 10,000 visits. So next slide. Um, I'll just uh, give some highlights of what has come forward through this engagement. And our team has organized all of the input we've received to date into some key themes. And the cross-cutting themes, uh, the themes you see on the left-hand side of your screen, are themes that came forward in every meeting across different organizations and groups in different communities and with Indigenous communities and organizations. And what emerged um, were a few things, but having a key focus on equity, inclusion, and relationship building. And that included uh, addressing in inequities across the city, um, a call to be more inclusive, reflect the diversity of the city, require universal and accessible design. Another theme that emerged was community-led solutions. So working collaboratively with communities, especially when it came to big change in, uh, in neighborhoods like big development, learning from the past and implementation. And that included understanding the history of communities and the history of community issues as well. Aligning priorities and conversations, so getting everyone on the same page, and that also included uh, leadership alignment. So the other themes you see um, on the right-hand side of your screen in the darker green were themes that uh, came up the most frequently discussed items. So things like housing affordability, uh, the scale of intensification, and the need to balance development with infrastructure, like green space and, and transit. Another theme uh, was environment and climate change, um, including a plan to get to net zero, promote active transit, protecting green space and trees. Um, another one was jobs, and that was particularly heightened through COVID. Uh, safety and complete communities where every neighborhood uh, needs a complete communities approach and they need to have a uh, universal design so people don't age out. Next slide. Okay, so now we have an engagement moment and we are going to have some polling throughout the meeting tonight. Um, so I will uh, ask for you to participate through your cell phone or you can also participate through your desktop computer. And we'll go to the next slide. I believe we have some instructions. Um, so you can go to menti.com and enter code uh, that's on the screen there, uh, 9982-1574, or you can scan the QR code that is on the screen um, with your smartphone. You can either, you can go to that website again on your cell phone or your or your desktop computer and uh, you'll see where you enter the code and then that's the code you will you will enter so i'll have nicole put up the mentimeter now and we can get started and the, the uh, instructions are also in the chat if you have any um, issues getting connecting so we're going to start with some questions and we're going to have again a variety of questions throughout the evening tonight um, so please leave it open when you do when you do get it open um, leave it open throughout the night because you will have these questions and some are kind of getting your feedback on things some will be understanding how familiar you are with the project and some are testing if you're paying attention so the first question tonight is where are you participating from and this meeting was specific for scarborough uh, so i'm not surprised to see scarborough emerging as um, as the the place with the most people who are attending tonight. So just remember when you select your option, press submit to actually have it count. Thanks everyone for uh, participating here. So we have, again, the majority of people coming in from, or calling in from Scarborough, and then we have a few um, from Toronto, East York, North York, and outside of Toronto as well. Okay, we'll go to the next question. So this is just a question for us to know um, if you have participated in other or plan Toronto engagements um, in, in the past. So again, I mentioned that there were some in the fall, and then we had the environment and climate change policies in, in, the, um, in April. So if you have, you can say yes, there's no, and then some people, yeah, you might not be sure. There's a lot of meetings that happen. So we have a lot of um, 
people who haven't participated in in the meetings with us tonight. So thank you for joining us and, and some that have. So, so thanks for joining us again. Okay, so maybe we'll go to the next question. Okay, so these are for this question is for those who have participated in um, the project engagement before and how you did so. So there, there's been a variety of activities that have taken place, um, citywide virtual meetings like the one we're having tonight. There's been other virtual meetings like stakeholder meetings. Um, there's been an online survey. We have a community leader circle. Um, and then we have our online tools, the website and social media, and also the story map. And you can select uh, more than one option. Okay, so we have a, a number of people who have attended um, some virtual meetings and um, a couple of our community leader circle members and a few people who visit the story map and, and an online survey. Okay, great. So I think we have um, two more questions. This is just to get an understanding of how familiar you are with the Toronto official plan. Um, so you can select one of the five options. We have all the way from not at all familiar to extremely familiar and everywhere in between. Okay, so we have um, many who are not at all familiar and, and that's um, okay because as I mentioned in the agenda, there is going to be a refresher on the official plan that Jeff will provide uh, shortly. Yeah, but yeah, a huge uh, range of um, baseline knowledge of the official plan, and that's okay because we will provide a refresh refresher and then um, point you to some documents that you can explore more if you're interested. Okay, so next question. So this is um, for those of you who uh, may interact with the official plan or use it um, and, and reference it for, for whatever purpose, and there's a couple options here. You could use it as a resident, as a member of a group or organization. You could use it for work or for school. And then other, and if anyone selects other, would love to know how you're using it. Oh, I do see one person. So yeah, please enter in the chat how you interact with the official plan. So most people are as a resident and then um, several for as a member of a group and organization and for, for work as well, and a few for students. Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone for participating. And as I mentioned, um, we will be coming back to some of this polling. So please leave Mentimeter open on your phone or your computer. Um, but for now, we'll get back to the presentation. And I am going to hand it over to Jeff to provide that overview and refresher about the official plan. Thanks, Kristen. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're good. Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, hi again, everyone. Um, so it's good to see that uh, some of you, uh, some of those in attendance have uh, know, what, know uh, something about our official plan. But those of you who don't, I can give a very high level uh, overview of uh, what what is the official plan and why are we here tonight uh, in front of you virtually. Uh, next slide, please. So the city of Toronto um, is part of a bigger region. So there's the province of Ontario with a population of about 14.7 uh, million in 2021. Um, and the city of Toronto is uh, nestled in what's called uh, the Greater Golden Horseshoe Area. So that's the map in the middle. Um, so that's the city of Toronto with the surrounding municipalities, like the regions of York to the north of us, the region of Durham to the east, and all the way down to Niagara and as far as uh, the city of Peterborough is part of the Greater Golden Horseshoe area with a population of 10.2. And there we are uh, on the right, city of Toronto. Um, when you go down to our scale, we have a population of just about 2.8 million uh, as of last year. Uh, next slide, please. So 
as the city is nestled in the, the, the region, the Greater Golden Horseshoe region, as is our land use planning system. So in Ontario, the overarching planning direction comes from the province. Um, and it filter, it, that filters down to local planning documents and decisions that we make at the city. So this image shows the nestling of these, the, pol the planning policy system that we work under. So at the very top tier are the matters of provincial interest, uh, including the Planning Act. Uh, the province has what's called the Provincial Policy Statement. And when you go further in, into the middle, there's the official plan. Sorry, but just above us, there's also uh, regional planning. So the province puts together the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe area, that, that area that I showed you earlier. Uh, that the city of Toronto is nestled in. And there's also something called the Green Belt Plan. Um, this is the plan that governs land use decision making basically to the north of the city. And then the next kind of tier nestled into that is the citywide vision, the Toronto official plan. And again, that's what we're here talking about. And then from there, uh, land, land use planning decisions are made um, or helped or guided by implementation documents like the zoning bylaw. Uh, that governs, you know, the um, the type of the exact type of uses you can have on your property, and then there's site-specific precision, pre precision, how the zoning bylaw is actually implemented on your lands, like the uh, the depth of your building, how many parking spots you you uh, a development has to have, that kind of that kind of those kind of details. So, like the city of Toronto is nestled in the in in the province in the region, as is our planning system where the official plan is nestled somewhere there in the middle to the system uh, that we work under. Next slide, please. The official plan that we're here to talk about is a city planning document that council adopts or approves that acts as Toronto's roadmap for land use matters. It sets out our shared long-term vision uh, and shared values and policies that help guide decision-making on land development, economic growth, the environment, and more. It's an important plan that helps us, the city, direct where different types of development should and should not go. Uh, next slide, please. This slide kind of shows how the official plan works. So the official plan is divided into several different chapters, uh, one through, well, five on the screen. And the biggest gear at the bottom shows uh, the land use designations. Uh, so there's the cover page of the official plan in the top right, and then the land use designation map uh, at the bottom right. And on the next slide, um, so the land use designations that I was talking about, so the city of Toronto, um, it has different policies that uh, discuss what type of uh, land uses can go in a specific uh, property or an area. So 77% of, of our city is not expected to accommodate much growth, uh, while 25% is. And if the city was broken down into 100 blocks, you see on the right, um, that about 35% of our city is uh, what's called uh, neighborhoods, the designated, it's a land use designation. Um, and up at the top, about 19% of our city are roads that don't have land use designations. And then on the bottom are the land use designations that are uh, identified for growth. So the purple or the 13% of the city are our core and general employment areas. So that's 13% of our city, whereas the red, about 5% are mixed use areas. So those are the land use designations that um, are expected to grow uh, as the, uh, given the official plan today that, that we're reviewing. So again, there's policies, there's mapping, there's, uh, there's direction and guidance. Of, for the for the future vision of the city of Toronto in our official plan. And before we go to the engagement moment, um, so part of the reason why we're here today is that the province of Ontario uh, requires that cities, municipalities, review our official plan regularly just to make sure that our municipal official plans are uh, conform to or or they they don't conflict with provincial plans and so every five years we go through this exercise where we review our official plan and as part of that review um, we consult and we engage and so that's the program that uh, Kristen was talking about and the other thing that the province does to for municipalities is they provide to us uh, what are called a uh, growth forecasts um, and so the province uh, projects that the city 
will grow by 700,000, a minimum of 700,000 people by 2051 and 450,000 jobs by 2051. And our requirement as, as the city of Toronto is to demonstrate to the province that we have a plan in place uh, to accommodate that forecasted growth. Um, so again, that's part of our, our jobs as uh, city planners is to, is to do what's called, what we're doing, it's called the conformity exercise to the provincial plans. Um, with that, I will pass it back over to you, Kristen. Okay, thank you, Jeff. So before we get into uh, time for Q&A about this information that was just presented, we are going to go to another uh, live poll, which I can see people are already, oh no, that's an old question. So we'll go to the next question. Um, and this is a bit of a testing, if you were paying attention during Jeff's uh, presentation there about what is the official plan for, and you can select all that apply. So, so far, overwhelmingly, we have people uh, selecting all of the above and a couple for setting the long term vision for the city and directs where development should go. And uh, the correct answer was, I mean, they're all correct because it is all of the above. Um, so it's a roadmap for planning in Toronto. It sets the long term vision. It directs where development should go and it provides the building blocks for complete communities. So thanks, everyone, for participating and listening. Great. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, you can hear me all right? Yeah, you're good. Yeah, great. Uh, so thanks, everyone. And, and uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. So I'll, I'll take a few minutes to talk through our major transit station areas, protected major transit station areas. Um, this is one of the major parts of the city's intensification strategy, as, as Jeff mentioned, many, one of the many parts of, of this official plan update. And um, essentially what we need to do is identify and delineate so sort of draw the boundaries around every major transit station area across the city. Um, Jeff showed that kind of that nestled diagram. So this is a, a requirement of the growth plan. It's one of the things the city needs to do. We need to demonstrate that we have delineated um, all the transit stations. So all the subway stations, LRT stations, and go rail stations across the city. Uh, next slide. Uh, so a little background on, on what a major transit station area is. Essentially, it is the area within a 10 minute walk shed, as I mentioned, of all the subway LRT um, and go rail transit stations. So if you are leaving your school, leaving your work, leaving your house, leaving a property, and you can get to a station, you can get to the, the main station entrance within about a 10 minute walk. So about five to 800 meters. Um, that area is what, where we are delineating the major transit station area. So it'll be this, you know, this circle around, an approximate circle around each one of our stations. Uh, the growth plan requires that all municipalities ensure that we have a land use planning framework within those delineated areas uh, that has a higher level of density. So uh, density measured by the province is people and jobs per hectare. And so around subway stations, we need to ensure that we have a planned minimum density of 200 people and jobs per hectare, at light rail transit stations, 160 people and jobs per hectare, and at GO uh, regional transit stations, we need to make sure we have a planned framework for 150 people and jobs per hectare. Uh, it's important to note that these density targets that are set by the province are just minimums. Uh, so these are the numbers that are in the growth plan that all municipalities within the growth plan area uh, need to adhere to. And we need to make sure that Toronto's planning framework allows for this high density. So not that there is that density in place today, uh, but that our planning framework allows for it into the future. Uh, next slide. So the next map shows, so this is the map of about 130 stations that um, to date city planning has brought forward to committee, either in draft form or, or in, the, in the case of the downtown and a few others in final form. Um, these are the areas that we are delineating around the city. So we have identified the, the areas, um, brought them forward. We are 
um, through this process and, and through lots of meetings that we've had over the last year and a half or so, we've been consulting on on the boundary lines and on some of the the, the target areas, or the, sorry, the target numbers that are included. Um, we've highlighted, and it's obviously of note for the Scarborough group tonight, uh, that the Shepherd East LRT, which was originally identified in the growth plan as a priority transit corridor is, is no longer identified as a priority project of the province. Um, now they have, they have shifted their priority to the Scarborough subway extension. Um, so we have brought forward those stations in draft format, but the province has advi advised us recently over in the last month um, that the stations along the Shepherd East LRT corridor uh, don't need to be included in this municipal comprehensive review, but should be included in future municipal comprehensive reviews. And I think a comment came in in the chat highlighting this a minute ago. If I if I don't quite address the comment, we can um, get back to it in the Q and A. But um, this stretch does have an existing planning framework, and and as Jeff mentioned, with those um, with that nestled diagram. Um, development still does need to be evaluated based on on the local conditions. So the fact that this station is no longer being funded by the province um, shouldn't affect the uh, the planning framework in place. Uh, next slide. Uh, so across the city, we have identified, as I mentioned, both protected major transit station areas and major transit station areas. Uh, the key component, the key differentiation, is that protected major, major transit station areas are the one space, are the one place that the province allows the city or any municipality to unlock inclusionary zoning. Um, back in November 2021, council approved a new inclusionary zoning bylaw, and that was supported by a market area analysis that looked at land values across the city. Uh, you can see three shades of blue, so the darkest in the downtown and kind of uh, lighter going out. Uh, within those three market areas is where um, our analysis has shown that that land values can support inclusionary zoning. And so anywhere that there is an overlap between a major transit station area and market areas one, two, or three, we are identifying it as a protected major transit station area um, in order to unlock the inclusionary zoning bylaw. Uh, so all the yellow dots will be PMTSAs, protected major transit station areas. And once these protected major transit station areas are, are approved by council and, and later by the minister, this will unlock our ability, or this will, will yeah, unlock our ability to use the inclusionary zoning bylaw, which requires development of a certain size to, to have affordable housing units as part of the new development. Uh, next slide. It's also important to note that this is part of a larger two-step process. So the what I've been speaking to is really part of step one, where, where we are identifying this minimum plan density. So again, this is the numbers that, that we're proposing are all minimum levels. So everything above is allowed, but nothing is allowed below that minimum density. Um, this is what allows us to satisfy the growth plan. So this is a requirement that we need to meet. Um, it, it establishes and kind of reinforces what's already in our official plan framework. And it, it allows us to, as I mentioned, unlock inclusionary zoning. So within that step one, we are including everything that is within our existing planning framework in the development pipeline, um, development that is approved but not yet built and reflecting anything in the existing secondary plans. Step two will be our work into the future, looking at future density and making sure that we are continuing to, to promote density and walkability close to transit. Um, and that future density will, will take different forms at different stations and will reflect the local conditions, future local studies, and also different planning um, exercises as we've talked about briefly. And I think we'll talk about more like the expanding housing options in neighborhood study. Uh, next slide. So to recap uh, where we are today, so we have brought forward, as I mentioned, 130 major transit stationary delineations to Planning and Housing Committee. Um, so far, 18 of these we 18 of these we have finalized, and, and Council has finalized. So back in December 2020 and 2021, uh, we're currently awaiting ministerial approval. This includes the the downtown core and Keel Finch area, and and in July on July 5th, we'll be bringing to Planning and Housing Committee. Um, the vast majority of the, the draft stations that are still um, outstanding. So we're, we anticipate 
uh, more than 100 draft major transit station areas, which will include many of them will be protected major transit station areas. We'll be bringing those to committee um, July 5th. So we're looking for for public input through meetings like this. We, we've we've hosted a number of other meetings on these, um, as I mentioned, over the last year, year and a half or so. Um, and we will continue to to build that. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. We have a online MTSA interactive tool. So this has been our major source for, for receiving feedback from the public and, and in many cases, very detailed feedback. So you can see on the screen grab um, where you're able to access it. So from our plan Toronto or from the official plan review website, our plan TO, you can find the link, uh, move into the, the MTSA interactive tool. Uh, next slide. Um, on the tool, it gives you a lot of the background that I just went through. So if you need a bit of a, a refresher or, or a different way to see it, uh, you can scroll through the background information. It'll give you the background of, of you know, what an MTSA is, what a PMTSA is. Next slide. As you scroll down to the bottom, you get to see the map that shows all the stations that we have brought forward to committee. So all 130 stations or so, the delineated boundaries and all of the, the stats that, that you can see on that right-hand side. So you can pick from a list or you can type in the station name to get to the station that you're most interested in. Next slide. And start to look through the different statistics. So we have there the, the estimated population today. So within that delineated area, how many people and jobs are there today? How big the, the MTSA is? What the plan density? And so the, the numbers that you're seeing there for base station. So a very, very high plan density uh, we're anticipating around Bay Station. Next slide. And you compare, you can compare these different density numbers. So in the case of Bay, you know, the estimated density today is about 487 people and jobs per hectare. And we anticipate that the existing planning framework would allow that number to go up to, to 936. And so that's the, the plan density, or the minimum density target we've established is 900. Uh, moving down. Uh, you can also look through the map data. So there, there's more data um, if, if you're interested to, to examine. So you can look at, at minimum densities for the PMTSAs, the different zoning bylaws that may be in place. And next slide. And we also have all of this data also broken down into tables. So if it's not working for you in a, in a visual format, it'll all be there and you can see the, um, the tabs at the bottom. You can go to that details tab to, to collect all the different station area for, for any station that you're interested in. And um, I believe that's that's the overview of the MTSAs, the major transit station areas, and protected major transit station areas. Uh, so I can throw it back to to Kristen if there's any questions that have come up. Okay, thanks, Josh. Um, we will actually go to the, our next polling question. We have a few questions about um, the MTSA section, and then we'll get into our Q and A. And I do see some questions in the chat, so that's great. Um, so again, bring up your Mentimeter for a couple of, um, of questions on the, MTS, um, on the MTSAs. Um, so first of all, we just want to know if you live or work near one of them, the identified um, MTSA sites, or if you if you don't, that's okay too. If you don't know. At least we have many people tonight who either work or live near one of the identified MTSAs. And a couple of people who don't know, and there is a link to that um, engagement tool, that MTSA interactive engagement tool that Josh walked us through. There is a link in the chat uh, from Ish that you can click on um, and explore and find out if you do live close to one of the identified locations. So we'll go to the next question. So this is a question about that tool. Um, have you used it before? Um, the MTSA tool that uh, Josh walked us through on the story map on our on our website. So we already have a couple of people who are going to after this meeting. That's great. Um, I do highly encourage you, if you haven't already, to check out um, the stations. You can just explore it. It is really interesting. Um, and uh, it's fun to check out the, the stations you maybe interact with as well. 
um, and uh, the ones close to where you live and work. Okay, so we have some people who have already, so that's great, and uh, a few that will after this meeting. Okay, I believe we have one more question. Um, so this is about the uh, minimum targets that uh, Josh outlined, and should the targets for people and jobs at these sites, should they be increased? Okay, so, so far we have um, kind of a split across the board of um, some people saying yes, some people saying no, and some people I don't know. And that's okay. Great, thanks, uh, Krista. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So I just wanna start off this, uh, this segment um, with, you know, it's a statement, it's an opinion um, that employment areas, again, when we get, went back to that map with the city, uh, the, the 100 blocks, the 13%, the purple blocks uh, of the city. So 13% of the city are our employment areas. They're called core and general employment areas, and they serve the public interest. These employment areas provide low barrier entry jobs for newcomers to Canada, those who, who face challenges having their professional uh, certifications recognized. Uh, here in, in Canada and in Toronto and individuals where English is not their first language. These, these lands, these 13% of the city provide jobs that, um, that provide a living wage. Uh, these are living wage employment opportunities in local, in local communities near to transit. And from an employer's perspective, um, these purple lands, the 13% of employment areas, they provide what's called land use certainty. So a business can operate, um, doing what they do, uh, per, that, and, and in, 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 in a lot of the cases in, in Toronto, these employment areas, um, they accommodate what, what we've, you know, grown to learn as essential goods and services. Um, and, you know, that it ranges from, um, you know, uh, waste management to the, to logistics, which, uh, you know, manif uh, which, sorry, which warehouse, you know, all, all the goods that we, that we consume um, on our day to day, and I can talk a bit. I can talk a bit about that in a couple more slides. Uh, next slide, please. So, in this slide, um, again, the 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 province of Ontario in the growth plan, again the regional plan uh, for the Greater Golden Horseshoe area uh, that the City of Toronto is nestled in, um, on the left uh, identifies what are called provincially significant employment zones. So that's the, the map on the left. And the map in the middle, again, is our 13% of employment areas. So the province identifies provincial significant employment zones. And we here at the city, um, we take that and we identify um, and designate those purple lands, the 13% core employment areas and general employment areas. And they're scattered across the city. They amount to 8,100 hectares of land. And as I, as I keep mentioning, there's 13% of the city. Um, they accommodate and, and house 25% of all the jobs in Toronto, so 400,000 jobs. And 92% uh, of the manufacturing, industrial, and warehousing jobs found in the city are within our uh, employment areas, core and general. Next slide, please. So as part of our plan Toronto, and as part of the review of our official plan, we retained a consultant named uh, Hemson. And they recommended, um, through their year-long study, they provided a number of recommendations to us. Uh, and they're all on the screen. And we'll put the link to, uh, to, the study, to their study uh, in the chat. It's, it's, it's a really comprehensive study, lots of data, lots of maps. Um, but some of the recommendations that they, um, they posed to us as, as the city is that we should be preserving, for example, number three, the third bullet, preserving lands, uh, employment lands, near major goods movement facilities and corridors. So those are like our highways, our, our, our on-ramps, off-ramps, uh, major streets, so that um, goods movement can continue to happen um, to get goods out of warehousing and delivered to our, our, our homes. Um, other 
uh, recommendations was to advocate for more provincially significant employment zones. So the province, uh, you know, the province's provincially significant significant employment zones are not equal to our employment areas. Uh, we have more employment areas in the province identifies as provincially significant. And also, one another recommendation was to support uh, office focused employment areas as well. Uh, next slide, please. Other findings that uh, our Hemson consultant brought to us, uh, three other ones, um, were again the equity lens that uh, the city's been um, applying through our plan Toronto, and and they found our consultants found that the employment areas are really important in achieving, uh, you know, our equity goals, particularly given the strategic locations of the uh, those thirteen percent of employment areas across the city. Some of them near to our uh, neighborhood improvement areas, and these are the um, the, the the NIA's neighborhood improvement areas are the parts of the city where um, where further public investment is required, uh, just given the lack of sort of past investment, and also the connectivity of our employment areas vis-a-vis -vis transit. Um, you know what we found uh, during the pandemic was that some of the busiest bus routes across the city were on the you know the big stretches of uh, Steeles Finch. Um, of people going, you know, going to work from their homes, uh, connecting to our employment areas. In terms of office, um, and and you know the office across, uh, the, sorry, the uh, office as an em employer in the city, um, and with you know the return to work, um, and whether or not we should be changing our policies to you know be more uh, work from home oriented, the uh, our consultants told us that they believe it's too early for us to determine if there are any permanent effects that come from uh, the, you know, these new emerging hybrid uh, work, work uh, office working practices. And so that we should just not make any major policy changes today, but monitor, uh, uh, monitor very closely what happens to our office market in the, in the coming months, in the, in the coming year or so. Um, so that was a recommendation and, and another uh, strong recommendation based on data was that we should uh, continue to, to be preserving and protecting our 13% of our employment lands, employment areas, because there is continued investment in these lands. And so the metrics or the, the data that they were using was the value of industrial building permits. So when, when someone applies to build a new building or make uh, additions to an existing building, they have to come to the city uh, to obtain a building permit. And the, 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 the cost of that building permit is, uh, is directly related to the complexity of the proposal. So for new industrial buildings in our employment areas in the 13% of the city, um, the city averaged or the building permits averaged over $48 million per year uh, since 2000. Uh, the building permits for additions and renovations averaged approximately $39 million per year, again, since 2000. And other types of permits like structural averaged about $26 million per year. Um, so clearly illustrating that there is a uh, continued investment happening in our employment areas, um, which in turn, you know, we can, uh, we can infer that there is a level of confidence in the city of Toronto where the, the private sector is continuing to, um, to invest in the city. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so a new policy that we are consulting on and, and are proposing is one surrounding e-commerce. Um, so maybe the, the picture on the right, some of you may know, uh, I think it was just last year or the year ago, um, Scarborough, uh, Northeast Scarborough on Steels, uh, I think it's just east of Markham on the south, on our side, not on Markham side, um, was uh, named to be uh, uh, Amazon's next uh, fulfillment center. And so part of our review, we're, we're looking at the trends and this new policy is to ensure that um, we in the city can have and encourage multi-level industrial development such as these last mile fulfillment centers. So they, in order to basically to, uh, to be situated close to us, you know, the urban market, so we can have our overnight deliveries um, when we order them on our phones. Um, so these larger facilities that are, that, that's happening in uh, North Scarborough is one type of uh, you know new use that we're seeing with 
e-commerce with uh, online shopping. And there's also these, what, what are called last mile distribution centers. So smaller buildings uh, that can, you know, act as, you know, the, the, the middle building between the big ones, the medium ones, and then our homes. Uh, okay, next slide, please. So another policy that we're reviewing uh, deals with land use incompatibility. So um, from a planner's perspective, uh, you know, putting residential next to um, uh, really sticky, smelly, noisy industries is not good planning. However, in the past, um, what we've done is allow some of that to happen. And so the province has told all municipalities that we have to update our official plans to prohibit, uh, to not allow residential in employment areas in that in those 13% of lands across the city. Um, and in some instances across the city, um, we have um, we have exceptions to that rule where they all they are purple, they are employment areas, core or general employment areas, but then there's a permission for residential uses. Um, and given the province's rules, we have to look at these, um, you know, policy incongruencies and and pick, you know, should it be employment or should it be residential? And so the couple in Scarborough, those orange circles, I believe that is um, uh, up in the Millican area, uh, Kennedy, Finch, Midland, and I think the other ones are the 401, around the 401, maybe that's... Uh, and it's Markham or Morningside, I'm not exactly sure. Um, so we're reviewing these. We won't be bringing these to the July uh, meeting of council. These will, we're gonna continue our study and then bring these to, uh, um, to city council in January, 2023, as city council um, after July takes a, a hiatus for the municipal election and resume back in January. Uh, next slide, please. Another major piece of the work um, members of my team are doing uh, together with our, our counterparts in economic development and culture are what are called employment conversions. And so what is a conversion of employment areas? It's, it's the introduction of a non-permitted use into employment areas. And so the province um, uh, allows, land, allows landowners to ask a municipality, so they're asking the city of Toronto for a conversion of their employment lands to introduce, um, for example, residential uses on their lands. You can only do this every five years during a municipal comprehensive review, which is what we're in right now. And so we at the city, we received over 140 of these conversion requests. And the work that uh, members of my team and ECDEV, uh, Economic Development, uh, are doing is a very careful consideration because I keep underscoring the number 13%. It's a finite land resource, our employment areas. So it takes a very careful consideration of each request. There are many, um, there, there are a number of uh, provincial policy tests and city policy tests that we have to satisfy before we as city staff can recommend to council a, a, an approval of a conversion or recommend a refusal of a conversion. So my team is undertaking this analysis, again, with economic, economic involvement. And so they're also here to answer any questions on this process. And the 140 conversion requests that we received, they amount to 685 hectares, um, which is about 8.5% of all of our city, uh, of all of our employment areas. Again, we can take questions on that as well during the q and I think I only have another slide or two left. Next slide, please. So the process for the conversion requests, as I mentioned, it, it's, it's, it's a, it takes careful consideration before we, um, we as city staff recommend approval or refusal of these conversion requests. So what we've done is uh, members of my team have written what are called preliminary assessments, basically telling uh, city council here, here is a description of what's being asked. And so these preliminary assessments um, have gone to planning and housing committee. Uh, we are doing a broad engagement. So we're meeting with the proponents, those who are asking for the conversion request, we're meeting with area businesses, we're meeting with area stakeholders. We we had a series of sector meetings. So we met with the, you know, the food and beverage sector, the manufacturing sector, uh, the schools, et cetera. And then the careful, the careful consideration, um, again, is a, a includes a technical review. Um, as I mentioned that the lands needs assessment, um, 
part of this, this technical exercise that other colleagues are doing. We're doing uh, many compatibility and mitigation studies. So, you know, because uh, our requesters are, are asking for residential, the question that we have to answer is, is it compatible? Um, and, and, the, and it's a very technical exercise where, you know, they, uh, where we uh, uh, engage uh, engineers, uh, wind specialists, noise specialists, et cetera. And then we will be writing final assessments for city council's consideration. Um, and so of the 120 plus uh, conversion requests that we received, we'll be writing um, final assessments to July 5th uh, planning housing committee. And we'll be doing a subset of our, of the, the of all of them that were received, not all of them. And we will uh, report on the remaining ones in January, 2023 that we don't get to in July. And I think that's it for me. Over to you, Kristen. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Um, before we get into the Q and A on this component, we will go to one question in our in our polling. Um, so bring up your Mentimeter, and there's a question uh, again, kind of testing if you're paying attention to Jeff's presentation about um, what will protecting employment areas help with. And so you can select all that will apply, all that you think apply. So, so far we have um, some rolling in, some responses rolling in for jobs for newcomers, um, helping provide living wage jobs, providing spaces for businesses, and uh, Toronto's economic competitiveness. It probably looks like, and then we have a couple, um, we have one at, one person who has said others, so would love to hear um, what your response is and you can feel free to put it in the chat. And then none of the above, um, a couple there, but most people have um, selected likely all of the answers. So all of them are the um, correct answer about what uh, employment areas will help with. Okay, so thanks everyone for participating and we will go back um, to, I see another one in there for others. So also feel free to put that in the chat. Uh, great, thanks very much. And I'm um, just being mindful of time. I might just speed up just a little bit so uh, we don't uh, keep people too, too late tonight. So uh, next slide, please. So the city uh, in April uh, adopted unanimous, unanimously uh, the city's first reconciliation action plan. So it's a 10 year plan um, that, you know, as part of that, that helps set a framework. There's, I think there's a 20, there's 28 recommendations. Um, many of what, some of which, um, can be directly applied to land use planning and the official plan. And so, you know, as part of, and, and you know, kind of the spirit and intent of the reconciliation action plan is as part of de decolonizing our structures, processes, and, and ways of working, um, the OP must acknowledge that the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people, uh, their world's views, and the, with respect to lands, sea, and 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 water and air, are very different from the, our colonial approach that has guided land use planning in Ontario, uh, and we recognize that. In the next slide, um, so as part of our as part of our Plan Toronto process. We've uh, engaged with with a number of treaty rights holders and caretakers uh, listed there, uh, advisory committees um, as well, and a number of uh, urban indigenous uh, organizations. Um, and our engagement was either again virtual, uh, phone calls, uh, surveys, or presentations, and and you know it was it was a lot about listening and learning, um, and 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 you know with the intent to to build relationships. Uh, to help understand, better understand how, you know, if at all, our official plan um, can uh, do better in terms of uh, decolonizing our, our processes. And next slide, please. So really, really quickly, the engagement process that we had uh, in relation to the Indigenous planning perspectives. So back last year in June, uh, June 2021, the City of Toronto has a Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee. So we presented to them uh, a year ago at the AAAC, and uh, 
from after that, from July to about February of this year, you know, we met with all those organizations that I talked about in the first the First Nations groups uh, as well. And it was, you know, it was all about listening, learning, and sharing. We had many meetings where, you know, they they talked about their First Nations, they, their, their their First Nations history, and and their their objectives and their priorities. And there were some meetings where they wanted to learn about the city, how the city operated, and, and we would have meetings. Uh, uh, again, a sharing, a, a meeting of sharing, and you know, the last couple of months, uh, members, uh, me and members of my team have really just been reflecting on what we learned, uh, drafting some uh, some ideas, and then doing more reflecting. Uh, and so, next month we'll be going to back to the AAAC, the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee, with one of what I'm about to present to you, and then um, in and then we'll continue our engagement after July. Uh, into December, and then hopefully come to City Council with a uh, final revisions and a modified official plan um, section. Uh, next slide, please. So the official plan uh, section that we're talking about is basically the beginning of chapter one. So as we started this meeting, and as we start many or almost all of our public engagement meetings, we start with land uh, land acknowledgments. So, from the staff's perspective, the official plan, we think, should recognize at the beginning of our official plan, why is it that we do land, land acknowledgements and the purpose of them? Um, and the purpose of land acknowledgements is, is about reflecting, is about, um, you know, reflecting on the past practices and how we can do things differently, uh, you know, in an effort and in a spirit of reconciliation. So, we think that should be first in, the first and the upfront of the official plan. Uh, secondly, you know, we, we want the official plan um, to seek the the direction to to amplify indigenous voices in planning processes, and it's about also uh, deepening understanding of contemporary urban indigenous uh, realities and experiences. So these are the statements that we'd like to include in the official plan that we're continuing to engage on. And straight out of the reconciliation action plan uh, is an is a recommendation to. Uh, to continue to to continue to identify opportunities for indigenous placemaking and placekeeping initiatives in new development, and in the next slide I'll speak to that a bit. And then obviously we want to uh, also include some language on uh, or a sidebar or explanatory text uh, explaining uh, the reconciliation action plan that council recently adopted. Okay, next slide, please. So indigenous placemaking and placekeeping. Um, what, what this means, uh, or what these are, are, are outcomes, uh, or the outcomes of placemaking, placekeeping initiatives. They're, they vary across the city, and they vary in terms of outcome, but they're very critical to the health and well-being of Indigenous peoples, what, as what we've learned. And so the, the outcomes of, or the initiatives, or how they manifest themselves, is integral to truth, reconciliation, and justice. And it creates spaces, um, and, and through process, and and, and for Indigenous peoples to have uh, a space for ceremony, for teaching, and for community. Uh, it also strengthens Indigenous connections with lands and water, and it helps, and it also helps to build cultural co competency for us as immigrants and for us as settlers uh, that, uh, to, to, to help us better understand uh, land-based Indigenous um, and how we engage with Indigenous peoples. Uh, next slide, please. So our next steps, as I mentioned, we are going to go to Toronto's Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee next month um, to just go into a bit more detail of what I just uh, talked about. Uh, we'll continue to engage with treaty rights holders and, and urban Indigenous organizations. And as I mentioned, final report uh, to Council with uh, these directions in our official plan for early 2023. And I think we can take questions now, uh, Kristen. Yeah, we just have uh, one poll. So if you can open up your Mentimeter, we'll go to our one question we have, and then we'll get to our, our Q&A. Um, so this is just if you're familiar with the City of Toronto's uh, Reconciliation Action Plan that was recently adopted by City Council. And if we can put a link in the uh, chat, um, because we do uh, already have some people who are saying that they will look at it after the meeting, um, that would be great. So you have many people who aren't uh, familiar or and many people who are going to look at it after this meeting. So that's great. 
Great. Uh, thanks, Kristen. And so I'll just, uh, I'll just reiterate that this, what I'm about to present at this last component is again, very, it's a very high level. These are principles. These are goals. These are objectives um, that we want to achieve uh, citywide. And so in the next slide um, is, is like an all encompassing image that talks about the layers that I'm just about to uh, break down and talk to you one by one about. So um, the next slide please is this draft vision statement and again it's a vision statement it's a it's not about on being on the ground on the sorry on the next side please um the 2051 draft vision statement um the first uh kind of uh, theme here is about the city uh, or the official plan in chapter one should seek to eliminate disparity disparities experienced by toronto by torontonians uh, the official plan should prioritize climate change action and sustainability towards net zero by 2040. And the official plan should be the roadmap for Toronto to become the most inclusive city in the world. So again, very high level aspirational uh, vision statements. And I'll go through these one by one uh, briefly. In the first slide, uh, when, when, when you know, we say the official plan should uh, eliminate disparities, what does it mean? You know, it means that, um, that we at the city should acknowledge that the post-pandemic recovery and rebuild has to acknowledge that people uh people in toronto had a very different lived experience uh amongst those uh those of us including myself that have had the privilege to work from home um and, and as opposed to you know having um you know a job an, an essential job that had to get me out of my house uh it means when, when we say eliminate disparities it also means um that we as planners should uh, challenge the systemic effects that land use planning um, has has uh, has created racial segregation, gentrification, um, limits to limits to opportunities, job opportunities. That we should challenge these and look for more outcome based directions that help to again reduce these disparities and build up what's known as social cohesion. It also means building complete communities and offering supports for opportunities of people of all ages, all abilities, uh, for them to, for everyone to be able to access the mo the, the, the necessities for daily living. On the next slide, in terms of uh, climate action, um, you know, we are prioritizing climate change. Um, we know that climate change is one of the biggest challenges facing our planet, and so our land use decisions should should work towards achieving sustainability and then move towards net zero in 2040. Um, uh, and on the next slide, please, the um, you know we want Toronto to become the most inclusive city in the world. You know we we know that you know the the, the Toronto's motto is the strength is in our diversity. Uh, check, we're there. But becoming the most inclusive city in the world means that, or acknowledges that development will continue to happen in the city, and we want to make sure that we create an inclusive city as as uh, more uh, more and more people choose Toronto as their home. As I mentioned in the beginning, the the province has forecasted a, a seven hundred thousand more people by twenty fifty one in the city, and we know that the federal government has set higher immigration targets in for the country, and we know that Toronto has always been a very attractive place. Uh, uh, for for immigrants to choose to settle in, and we also we want to continue to welcome uh, newcomers to Toronto, and we want to make sure that there are pathways to prosperity uh, for 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 all who choose Toronto. And how do we get there? In the next slide, there's three principles uh, we think that uh, make for a successful and inclusive city. Um, so successful city building, and it is, it, it's about access, equity, and inclusion. So access is about improving access to many facets of daily, daily life, access to good jobs, access to transit, access to affordable housing. Um, from an employer's perspective, it's, it's access to the labor pool. And in terms of the equity lens, which we continue to talk about, um, and, and, and what I hope the official plan uh, language will be able to do is help uh, define what that means. And, and what it means is about uh, removing barriers for the city's most vulnerable communities for achieving uh, transformative change, not the status quo, a change for the better um, and inclusive growth. And lastly, inclusion, inclusion. And that's about creating safe and inclusive city for all Torontonians. And again, those that are yet to arrive because we know the city is going to, going to continue to grow. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it back to Kristen.
Okay, thanks, Jeff. So we have uh, two last questions in our polling. So if you can open up your mentee and then we'll get to um, uh, some time for Q&A. Um, so we just want to know um, how supportive are you of that official plan vision, the draft official plan vision that Jeff just outlined um, and the three areas there of eliminating disparities, uh, prioritizing climate action and becoming the most inclusive city. Um, so you can rank your um, support on a scale there from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And make sure you submit your answer. Okay, so, so far we have um, many people strongly agreeing. Okay, so we've got um, a four point something for the eliminate disparities and most inclusive city and then a five for prioritizing climate action. So if you if you do have like comments on on how this could you could be more supportive of this or you know areas that you want to point out you can put them and in, in the chat and we're happy to hear your feedback on that uh, but we will go to the next question our final polling question of the evening um, and we want to know about um, how supportive are you of the official plan principles that uh, Jeff outlined so that was the three principles of access equity and inclusion Okay, so we have um, most people agreeing with these as well, all around the four point something. And again, happy to hear your feedback in the chat if you have uh, any comments to add about that. And we'll also um, have some time now for questions. We'll have about five minutes for questions before we wrap up for the evening. Next slide, really, really quickly. Um, as Josh mentioned, next week at Planning and Housing Committee, there's a final report about uh, updates to our environment and climate change policies. And uh, maybe Josh can put the link uh, for that report in the chat. And in July 5th, as I've mentioned, we're going to bring forward a final report on major transit station areas and protected major trans transit station areas that Josh uh, uh, presented on. And as well on that same uh, agenda is going to be uh, a final report on our employment policies and a subset, uh, a handful of our final assessments for some of our conversion requests, not all. And then in early 2023, um, there'll be the remaining major transit station area uh, final report and then uh, the remaining c conversion requests, as well as the, the new chapter one that will take care of, that will uh, take care of uh, indigenous planning perspectives and the OP vision and statement directions. Thanks, Kristen. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. And I will just um, provide some meeting dates on the next slide. Ish has also put them in the chat, so thank you. Um, but we do have some other meetings uh, uh, next week. We have um, uh, in North York for North York on May 30th, Toronto and East York on June 1st, and then we have our public uh, virtual open house on June 7th. Then we have a three uh, policy focused meetings at the end of June, June 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. And that's on uh, specific, to dive into specific policy areas. First one being employment lands and the future of work. The second being neighborhoods and complete communities. And the third being housing and intensification. So I hope that I, I know some of these issues are raised in the chat and then through the questions. So if you're really interested in these subjects, I hope you join us again. Um, thank you so much everyone for, for coming tonight. And uh, we really appreciate the time you took to interact and to ask questions. And we really appreciate the feedback you provided tonight. So thank you everyone and have a great night.